Welcome to the second segment of our router table build where this time we are going to install all the hardware uh, for our router table top to actually make it a functional router table. And that's going to include a nice uh, T-track up along the front so that we can use jigs and stuff like that in the future. Uh, then we are going to be installing the router plate. Then I'm going to cut up a different kind of T-track to create two guides for our fence to ride along. Now the lift, uh, this T-track, and this right here were all provided to me from uh, Rockler. Uh, I actually chose uh, the router plate and I approached a prior contact for them to see if I could work out some kind of deal. And along the way, they wanted me to try out some of these T-tracks. And I was going to do just standard woodworking. I mean, you can cut a T-track in plywood with just a special router bit. And I had my old Jessam uh, fence that I was going to use, or we could have easily created one. It's very simple. But since they were offering, I, I wanted to try them out. Now, to do this, we're going to use multiple different ways of inlaying items. And this is a great chance to practice Stuff that you might use in the future for intarsia or veneering or even some types of joinery this these kind of techniques are going to be using. And because it's a good practice piece, I'm going to try and do a different technique to install each one of these different items so we can play around. And you can also pick one that you like the best to do your own router table with. So the first one I'm going to do is installing the T-Track for the front groove. Now, I do not know any hard and fast rule to, of deciding where you want to put your T-Track as far as distance from edge or closeness to the router bit or something like that. I haven't read anything, so I'm just going to kind of guesstimate what I think it's going to be. So to do that, when I first found the center, that way I can easily position the router plate the way I think it should be right there in the dead center somewhat thing and then just kind of guesstimate where I think this groove thing should be and then find the edge to the top side the distance so that right there is five inches that looks about right now the first technique I'm going to be using I'm going to use the table saw simply because this piece right here is a groove all the way through my table so the table saw seems like the most effective tool to do. Now I have a combination blade in here, which means it is not going to have a flat bottom. So the first thing I want to do is set the depth of my cut. And what I want to do is get the tooth of the very top piece either right and even with it or slightly below it. I don't want it to be higher than this, even though it's not going to go down to the depth the bad ears on this type of blade kind of leave these two crescents. Let's see if we can focus in on that. And that's what we want to be the bot bottom of our shoot, not the top of the crest, which is higher. We'll remove that later. If you do have a flat bottom blade, you can pretty much get it dead perfect. But my goal is to either have this perfectly flush with my right router table top, but more likely it's going to be ever so slightly recessed down. Maybe just the half the height of that white laminate on top. That way I couldn't put a little bit bevel. The worst thing it could be is slightly above so that it will be raising work off of the table. So I've now set my height the way I want and I set this distance right here to five inches. Next, I want to be able to set the groove, the spacing, to exactly match this piece. And there's a trick to doing that. It is finding some kind of shim that is the perfect sizing of the kerf of your saw blade. I have this little blast piece and I just ran this through. I also did a test of it to make sure it worked. And it just barely fits in the width of that kerf. So I'm going to use this 
and the aluminum piece I want to size to perfectly fit the groove. Here are the steps to do that. So the steps for sizing it just for this piece is first I'm going to lower the blade. Then I'm going to take my piece, I'm going to put it right up against the fence right after I made that cut. I'm going to slide my board right on over. I'm using the board simply because it's really heavy and with that blue tape it ain't moving anywhere. Okay, so now I'm going to loosen the fence up in order to remove this piece right here. Then I bring my fence right back over and lock it down. Okay, so I've now moved my fence over exactly this distance. The problem is I still have this kerf to deal with. Because if I brought, if the, the saw blade made the cut and I moved this over exactly that distance, well, I've now got this distance plus the width of my kerf. So I've got to use this right here to remove that width of the kerf. So what I'm going to do is I'm now going to loosen this up. I'm going to place my shim right next to my piece and then bring my fence right back over. So I've now got the distance of my table saw kerf going back the other way, thus taking it out of that side right there. So now you just need to raise up your saw blade back to that perfect height. Lock it down and make your cut. So I should end up with two curves that are the exact width of my slot. So me personally, I'm just gonna run this over my table saw a few more times to get rid of this middle piece, and then I'll show you how to flatten out the bottom. A perfect fit. But what isn't perfect is it's not completely flush. I can still catch my fingernails on there, and that's caused because my uh, general purpose uh, saw has those bad ears. It's not a flat bottom. So the bottom of those bad ears are my perfect depth. I just need to get rid of these tops. And the best tool to do that is a router, but not a router as you're thinking. <laughs> a router plane, though you can use a regular router on it. I just look like look using these because I don't have to deal with rotation. I don't have to deal with the snagging on either side. And I have found that these are generally a little bit more accurate. I don't know what it is, but a handheld router, you end up sometimes getting a little undulation. Can't explain why. I don't really get that with this tool right here. Now, a router plane is one of those specialty planes that really isn't that much money. I want to say that this, the larger lot size ones from both Lee Valley and Veritas are, you know, a little over a hundred bucks because machining wise they don't have to be ultra ultra accurate but the idea is you just set the depth of the blade just like you would a router bit on a router to the depth you want to go lock it down then back your adjuster up a little bit because the blade is going to want to drag it down and you've always got a little bit of slop on top I will even bring my brace all the way up to make sure that my adjuster doesn't go down at all. And then you can just run it along and it will remove however lower that depth is. These are, uh, this is a specialty tool that is like, should be one of the first hand planes you get after maybe, a, after maybe a block plane if you are kind of a power tool user. Uh, you use handheld routers and your router table a lot. It's just going to be an incredibly useful tool.
so there we go a perfect fit now sized perfectly now one thing you need to note is this linoleum or whatever that is right there it is somewhat fragile on the edge so what I would suggest doing is taking a little bit of sandpaper and just putting the slightest of bevels all along this edge it won't really affect performance but it will prevent some chip out in the future so next up is to attach it now I am kind of picky and I do like my screw holes to line up so if you don't get it lined up perfectly here don't don't fret coming over a little bit and getting your line, your holes just exactly centered the way you want want and just cutting off both sides instead of just one side and don't forget to match the bevel on this right here because that could be a nasty catch if you don't I will say, I'm a, I am a little bit disappointed. My whiteboard chipped out a little bit from the table saw. This right here is just glue residue from the blue tape and sawdust and stuff like that. But that did come off the table saw. But I guess what do you expect for a $10 piece of laminate? Next up, we are going to be mounting our router tabletop. Basically, just inlaying it enough for this rim to sit down in there. And there are a lot of different ways you can do it. Probably the most common one I've seen in magazines and books like that is just laying out some boards that lock into it and then routing out the center section. Uh, upside of that one is it's quick and easy. The downside is uh, if you get it wrong you pretty much messed up your entire top and while we do not have a lot of money invested in the top we now have time in it and time is always more valuable than money. The other thing is you don't get practice in some skills that you might apply in the future. And I do want to do some batch production work with this router table. That's why I'm building it. So developing some patterns uh, and doing pattern routing makes a lot of sense. And this is the perfect time to practice that. Plus the fact that if you make a pattern for this particular router tabletop, in the future if you want to replace your top, real easy to do and you already got the pattern ready to rock and roll. Now in pattern routing the idea is you create some kind of pattern. It can be either an outside or an inside cutout. We're doing it inside with the router table. And you remove this material so it fits perfectly. Then you can lay your template on any other substance and using your router duplicate that exact shape perfectly every single time. And the tools you're going to be using are some kind of pattern routing bents. A lot of time we are using a flush cut like this one right here which has a bearing on the top and bottom so that you could put this pattern underneath whatever you want to do it then plunge down and use the uh, bearing on the bottom to go all the way around or you could do it on top of the piece you want to route out and use a top bearing. Well because we are going to be just going in a quarter of an inch I had to go buy a special bit. I, I don't have any other use for this kind of bit other than going down that you know quarter or eighth of an inch and then following along whatever pattern we have. My problem is these corners. Now the idea is you know you're going to line the corner up right there and then we will be running our router bit around here and coming around. The problem is if you do not have your bit at the exact diameter of this corner you're going to make this corner not only gappy around there, but it's going to be a sharper corner. Your router plate will still fit in there, but there will be a gap there. You really do need a perfectly sized bit to do that one. But getting a bit that large just to make these corners, that's an expense I just can't stomach. In fact, I don't have that kind of money. So, my solution is to think that I do have Forstner bits that are real close to that shape. I don't know if that corner is metric. I have... Uh, uh, SAE Imperial Forstner bits but what I could be doing is set this up on the corner and then move my bit over into that corner and drill a hole right there and that should get me really really close if not a tad bit short and I can fine-tune it with sandpaper 
So my first step on my template is I'm going to do the same thing I would have done on the table itself. Just set your pattern around here. But I want to be able to remove these. So what I'm going, I'm going to use the blue tape trick where I put down blue tape all the way around. I also put blue tape on the back of these boards I'm using to fit it. I'm also going to put one layer of blue tape on the face that I'm going to be fitting right next to the router to give it just a little bit of, I guess you would call it clearance. And then you use hot glue on the blue tape to kind of fit them. That way you can remove this stuff when you're done routing without damaging your template. Make sure you have no gaps all the way around. And if you do, just peel it off and do it again. And then you can remove your router plate. Remove your uh, clearance tape. Take the Forstner bit you're going to be using and find one edge where you can touch it either side. That way you'll know you'll get as close as you can and then give it a tap to seat that pin. Now the smart thing would be to go to your uh, drill press, but I never said I'm smart. So I'm going to take that center punch from the center spur of my Forstner bit I'm going to try and drill a hole just absolutely parallel, straight through. That, then it's simply a matter of lining everything up and drilling halfway through or a little more than halfway through from one side and going to the other. Now a little trick as you're first starting out, watch the circle and watch the polishing that comes from both the center spurs and that. If it's even, you know you're standing it straight up and down. If it's a little heavier on one side than the other, then you know you need to adjust it. So start out slow so you can get your upper body centered just right so that you're happy with it being straight up and down. And then just lean on it. Now, if you think about it, you don't really have to go all the way through. You just need a big enough area for the bearing to ride on. So by drilling out that center point and then using my jigsaw to get rid of the rest, now I only have to remove maybe a quarter of an inch utilizing this right here to get most of it and then I will drop it down to get the inside corner. So utilizing bench cookies, seriously, I bought these, I want to say 10 years ago when they first came out and I was just getting into woodworking thinking I want to do all this stuff this might very be the very, very well be the very first time I've used these and I'm going to be using them for their original intent lifting your work off of your bench to actually route <laughs> I've also set up my router where the bearing is on the top and that is going to ride along the edge of the plywood I'm going to be very careful not to get close to these corners right here because I'm going to then flip it upside down use the bottom bearing bit to get the rest of it riding where my Forstner bit was.
Now they say power tools don't take as much of skill as hand tools, but it really is just a different kind of skill. And I truly hate hand rounding. It seems you never had the right bit. Distances are always off. But one again, it's kind of knowledge that you kind of build up in game. Uh, it seems like every single time I always tilt it and I get these little kind of burrs right there, which I am going to mix them some putty and lay it in there, smooth it out in the morning, and hopefully it'll all be okay. But this is pretty good. I'm not quite happy with my corners, but we'll see how it works out on a test piece. I won't do it on my main piece. We're going to try it out on a test piece first. I guess before we put the putty in, let's just see if it fits. Uh, it's a little tight. Let's see where. Fits that side. Fits that side. Fits that side. Fits that side. So it's got to be a corner. Uh, I think it's this corner right here. But it's pretty close. I wonder if a persuader would help. Yep, saw it took. A little persuasion. Now that's a tight fit. I don't know if this will work because it's really tight. But maybe if I swell the fibers, this is alcohol, denatured alcohol. Maybe if I swell the fibers while it's in there, whenever it dries, shouldn't it retract? I guess we'll find out in the morning. I'll just let it dry. So it's been overnight, so let's see how the fit is. Okay, maybe the swelling didn't do anything. Oh, there we go. Oh, cool! Either me hammering it down or the the compression and release of the alcohol has created a little ledge right here and you can kind of feel it and especially on these corners and that's probably where i was binding up right there so this is a kind of an opportunity for me to show something to you yeah that bit is toast the bearing wasn't moving so it's getting hot so that's where that burning was coming from so from actually the bearing but you can see it didn't cut. That's because your bearing gets kind of stuff on it that makes it a little bit bigger so that your cutting edge is never really running directly on that. It's off a little bit. That's why I, I thought that blue tape going around it creating a uh, clearance would have been a good idea. So in the future I know I'd probably need to put two or three wrappings of blue tape to get more clearance. But on this particular example I'm going to fill in my errors, and then I have a feeling that if I sand down that putty afterwards, it'll give me the clearance I kind of want to get a little bit looser fit.
Okay, so the template is now cut. Moment of truth. Is it gonna fit? Let's see if it fits. Okay. Does it need a little persuasion? It seems to fit everywhere but this one corner. Can you see where I'm pounding it? Kind of. Did it? So maybe I got a little bit off on that one corner when I was routing. Let's find out. Oh, I think I see the problem. I had sawdust in this corner. <sighs> Luckily, because of one little blemish right there that got transferred through, I know that I've got everything lined up and it's flush all the way around. So. And I definitely just missed this corner. So I'm just going to clamp it back down and re-hit that one corner and let's see if it fits. And I guess, you know, if I can flush it back up in the same exact spot, if it's a tad bit tight or something like that, I could reflush it and maybe just move it over a few thousands, reclamp it down, verify everything, and then just take off what I need a little bit larger. This should work. Oh yeah. You know, it's not a perfect fit. You know, I, I, uh, yeah, I got a little gap right there. But it's tight, it's not going anywhere. I'm happy. I don't know about you, but I'm always nervous, no matter how many years I've been doing this, when you get a big cut where everything depends upon it, I'm always nervous. <laughs> now we get a, need to get totally get rid of the center section. Now you will see me using setup blocks like these. I believe I got these from Whiteside. They're just black brass and they're machined to a very specific thickness. Earlier I used this one right here to set up how deep I went into my plate, my desktop, because it is just a tad bit, can you see it's stopping right there, too low. So whenever I recess this in, my plate will set slightly below my table and I can use these riser pins to raise it up to get it to the perfect thickness all the way around. Well, I'm also going to use another setup block because I actually we need to remove this center section right here. So I just need to figure out how far over I need to come. And this plate right here has this lip that runs all the way around and all the parts that protrude down, for instance, the gears and stuff like that, are inside that lip. This setup block right here is just ever so slightly too short. So if I know I use this as the guide and I remove my pencil line, I won't have any clearance problems whatsoever. 
I very rarely in all my woodworking use actual measurements. I'm always fitting one part to the other and it's from because I come from my hand tool background. I'm machining work here and I'm still fitting to the line and sawing to the line. Excuse me, I'm fitting parts together and sawing to the line they generate. think we might have us a router table. <laughs> Uh-oh, got my bench a little bit. Oh well. Let me grab some stools and let's see if it fits. Oh, but don't forget to round over those ed fragile edges. Give, give them the slightest of round over. Just so they don't crack off. I'm just using a sandpaper and on a little foam pad. We got our push buttons up front. Uh, maybe. Oh, there we go. Pretty tight fit. And as I said earlier, we went a little bit lower. So now I need to remove all these pins and mark those spots on the plywood. Well, there we go. Nice and flush all the way around. Easy adjust with these though. I guess adjuster pins and stuff like that. Snap on our plate. And we got that's a router table that's actually working. Well, once we get the fence on. Now Rockler did send me this fence to try out. Uh, it's kind of a standard design. You got the aluminum. It's like an L bracket. You have these two adjustable MDF things, you can actually offset them off a little bit so you could use your uh, jointer as a planer, but that's kind of standard function wise. My thinking though is where to locate the adjustment. What the, I'm never going to be using bits bigger than this, so I'd say this is probably as far forward as I want to ever adjust it, and then you probably might do box or something like that, so come back a little bit. So. This thing is actually adjusted because on either side you have these slots and you have these little twist pigs and they come down and you put some kind of T-slot. I will tell you the standard T-slot that I used here, I thought it would work but I had to go get a bigger one and Rockler does make this size and it's just so that a hex head will fit in there and not twist. This one's just a different size so it doesn't fit the nuts that come with the bolts that come with the rocker setup so that's why i ordered this one off of amazon just so it will be here in a day so a quick mark on both sides will tell me how far forward the fence should max out at and that'll tell me where the front of my groove should stop for these little insert pieces now when centering and kind of eyeballing it, I don't think the exact location matters where you position it. I would just say put it in the middle 
That way, if you want to, in the future, for some odd reason, rotate it, well, it'll slide on those pins, however you do it, and allow you some, I guess, wiggle room right there. So our question comes, do we want to put these grooves so that they come all the way back off the back side? That way, whenever we want to slide the pins in, we just kind of come in the back side. That'd probably be the easiest thing to do, and it would let us experiment with using a router with a guide maybe on the side because we've got these parallel and just come straight in with a router bit this size. The other option you could have is coming in a little bit so you can maintain the integrity right here and then just insetting this somewhat how we did right here. Creating a jig so you could plunge down into it and then come up through it. But since I don't have a bit that fits this size perfectly, I'm going to have to route out a, a space and multiple passes. So I'm going to try to try a capture guide. We're, we're going to capture the router in a specific space, which also means I'm going to come in through the backside. Ooh. Now this aluminum T-Track, it is right over 7 eighths, just a tad bit. Unfortunately, my router brit that I'm using is a very precise three quarters of an inch. So I need to add an eighth of an inch to the groove that this thing makes. Luckily, I have one of these brass setup blocks that is a perfect one eighth. So if I can somehow make a jig that is that plus that, I then have the groove for my T-Track. So my first step for doing a captured thing create the jig. We use a little bit of hot glue. Make sure it is a perfect 45. Use a few nails to hold it. Do the same for the other end. Then the idea is I'm going to use a business card that will give me the little extra I needed plus that brass shim. And then you're going to want to use your router in its orientation that you're going to be doing it because this circle right here might not be a perfect circle. I'm going to have the handles on either side so I'm going to bring this over and that right there will set my width on this side. Slide your stuff down, bring your router in. You were trying not to move this. We're going to bring this down. We're once again going to business card, brass dowel, sliding that around. And notice I have not secured the other side yet. I just want to get it as close as possible on that side before I came down to this side. And at this point in time, I'm going to put a nail. Just one nail on this end. The whole idea was I just wanted to get it close on one side before I did the other side. Because now I can go back to that first side and reset up the whole thing. If I slide it along, yes that moved a tad bit, but I have a single point on this end so I can just bring this over I should be getting everything just about perfect now. So I got five nails on that side. Bring this back down. Recheck it here. Brass. I mean, business card. Brass. Slide it so it compresses down. Doesn't push over that way. And yes, I have a nice tight fit on this side. So I'll put my five nails over here. So for a quick test, got the router in here. We're going to be going clockwise because the router bit is going that way. It'll give us a safest cut. Let's try it out.
like it's going to work. Maybe I could not use that business card. The advantage of not gluing one side, I could take it apart. see how this one did. Oh, much better. A little, yeah, that's a lot better. I like that. We'll go with that. Now, I'm not going to tell you I'm overly thrilled with the way I'm clamping this right now. It is precarious on the edge right here. It only comes over about an inch right there. But I needed to get this center lined up where I wanted it on the board. And because I'm doing it on my bench, yeah, it, it's tight enough to work. I don't think it's going to be loose. I did make it parallel with the sides, and I double-checked it here since these two are parallel. So it all should, should work out okay. I did set the depth of my router to that silver T-track. I also threw a couple things of blue tape around the edge just to tighten it up a tad bit. So, let's try it out. Now these temporary jigs like this, I mean, I know people that are die-hard hard router users, they use them all the time, and it is a skill development. I mean, I do this kind of stuff very rarely just because in the past I haven't used routers as much. I would much rather just reach around and grab a chisel, mark my line, slice the line, chop out the waste. It's, to me, it seems faster a lot of times. I mean, this was a fairly long process just to make a stop dado. But like everything, the more you do something, the easier it gets, the better your results are. I mean, even in this just little example right here, uh, I only did it twice, a couple practice pieces, but I only did it twice. And the second one, nice clean results, pretty good, nicely rounded. The first one, I've got some minor chip out of my piece. I was probably going too fast on that initial cut and I can tell it's going to bind up right about there. So I'm probably going to have to hit the outside of this with a little sandpaper to thin it down just a little bit because there's a little taper right there. Can't explain why. But things take practice. And if you're going to practice you might as well do it on something that isn't that big a deal. Like your shop equipment. Nice smooth fit. So next up, we need to either square off the end or round the bar. Most people square off the end, so just to be difficult, let's round off the bar. To do that, I'm knocking it as far forward as I can. Get it so that the top section will meet right about there. And then you can just use them to scratch the pattern you want. And then I will darken it in so y'all can see it on the camera. And it's an odd angle for the camera, but I think y'all can see what I'm doing there. And because we're on this power tool kick, I'm just going to use a belt sander. And remember, if you're a blue tape obsessed like I am, eventually you're going to have to take all this stuff off.
So, there we go. A working router table. Something we could use for the rest of this project if we choose to do so. Now, I hope you all noticed that. This was outside of my comfort zone. I have never liked using routers, and that's one of the reasons why I'm getting a router table is because the other options I've had, I've never enjoyed doing using them. So, if I'm not going to enjoy it, I might as well make it at least bearable. Noise levels, accuracy, all that kind of stuff. That was my motivation for making a router table. But little things. I've got chip out. I've got mistakes. Nothing about this is perfect. I could blame that it was a cheap, cheap $10 laminate. I can't blame my blades because they're all brand new. They were sharp. These were sharp tools. So it's probably just my use of the tools. I definitely know that on these router table, the, these slots right here, I went slower and I got better results. Which tells me that with this laminate stuff, I was probably going too fast and that's what resulted in a lot of this chip out other than me just banging around and knocking a little bit off the edge. So, practice showed me insight so that if I ever use this for maybe making a kid's table or something like that, something that's going, only going to last a family for four or five years, kids will draw all over it. It's an, a $10 laminate top on some plywood would work wonders. This was great practice for anything like that I want to do. Plus, it kind of got me back into using power tools. Well, I hope you enjoyed this. It's a bit long one, but we now have a very flat, usable, slick, everything's level, got adjustments, easy to do. It's ready to rock and roll. Our next step is to build a chassis this thing's going to sit on.